Buenas tardes a todas, a todos. Eh, soy Ana Longoni, directora de actividades públicas del Museo Reina Sofía y les quiero dar una cordial bienvenida a esta conferencia de Judith Butler eh, en el marco de la Cátedra de Políticas y Estéticas de la Memoria, coordinada por Nelly Richard. Eh, esta es la actividad de cierre de la segunda edición a la que hemos titulado Memorias en Desamparo, eh, la segunda edición de la Cátedra eh, que comenzó el año pasado y que ha tenido una hermosa acogida a lo largo de estas últimas semanas. Eh, es la primera vez que Judith Butler eh, hace una actividad en el museo, estamos muy felices de contar con ella porque es una enorme y crucial referencia intelectual eh, y política dentro de los debates feministas para todas nosotras. Eh, muchas gracias Judith por, por estar aquí, eh, hubiéramos eh, estado felices de tenerte en, en, en vivo, en presencia, pero también es una posibilidad de mantener este diálogo, de abrirlo para que haya nuevas oportunidades de encuentro y también es la posibilidad de que hoy podamos abrir esta conferencia para que la pueda seguir mucha gente en distintas partes de, del mundo. Hay mucha, mucho interés en escuchar tus, tus palabras en torno a la memoria de las pequeñas cosas eh, y también en escuchar el diálogo que entre Nelly y Judith se ha venido dando en los últimos años a partir de sus encuentros en Buenos Aires, en Santiago de Chile, etc. Eh, Nelly Richard, teórica chilena, eh, que coordina la Cátedra eh, Políticas y Estéticas de la Memoria, va a introducir a Judith. Bueno, muchas gracias Ana, John, y sobre todo muy especialmente a Judith. Eh, voy a hacer una presentación muy breve. Eh, simplemente, primero, decir que es un enorme placer poder contar con con Judith, aunque sea virtualmente, en esta versión 2020 de la Cátedra Política y Estética de la Memoria. Eh, ella es una figura tan ampliamente conocida que no considero necesario resumir aquí su trayectoria. Solo quiero compartir con ustedes algunas pequeñas apreciaciones de por qué consideramos oportuno, necesario y precisa, preciso poder contar con ella eh, en esta versión que tiene que ver con memorias en desamparo. Me gustaría primero recordar que Judith, junto con ser una teórica feminista, cuyos textos hablan el lenguaje de la filosofía política, eh, que es una disciplina que se profesa en la academia. Eh, Judith es alguien cuyo posicionamiento intelectual está siempre conectado con eh, la vida pública, con los conflictos, con los antagonismos de la sociedad civil, con la lucha, la resistencia, en contra de todas las formas de violencia. Y me parece a mí que es este compromiso siempre renovado con una exterioridad de fuerzas en movimiento el que le permite a Judith no dejarse atrapar eh, por la fetichización académica del nombre asociado al, al culto de la firma de autora. Eh, cuando Judith... Butler habla de teoría, eh, ella habla a menudo de una teoría necesariamente impura. Eh, es decir, una teoría que no se piensa autosuficiente y que, la cito, dice ella, una teoría que surge donde la exigencia de traducción ¿no? entre hablas y contextos es aguda y su éxito incierto. Es una cita que me, me gusta siempre recordar. Es decir, que muy lejos de refugiarse en la certeza eh, del método o en la fuerza probatoria de un sistema de conocimiento general, eh, Judith se muestra... Eh, consciente siempre del riesgo y diríamos de la vulnerabilidad de la teoría, eh, de sus imperfecciones también, 
cuando la teoría se experimenta con cuerpos y con discursos eh, atravesados, ¿no es cierto?, por eh, pugnas de, de valor y de signos. Hablamos en, este, en, este, en esta jornada de actividad de la cátedra, hablamos de revueltas. Y qué duda cabe que en el libro Cuerpos aliados y lucha política, Jody Butler aborda cuestiones decisivas para, lo, para comprender lo que ella llama una teoría performativa de la asamblea. Eh, su libro nos habla de la potencia expresiva y nos habla también de la capacidad de agenciamiento político del estar juntos, del ser juntos, del estar juntos, de los cuerpos que se toman en la calle, en las marchas, las protestas, las asambleas, etc. Eh, el libro nos sirve para comprender que la asociatividad del estar juntos forma una red provisoria, variable, contingente de cuerpos que frente al poder realizan una demostración de fuerzas al ocupar lo público, unidos entre sí por un acto de habla, ¿no? denunciar, reclamar, proclamar, etcétera, que los hace converger enunciativamente, diríamos. Pero, y eso me parece muy importante, el libro de Judith Butler también nos sirve para comprender que la contingencia del estar juntos no es equivalente al fundamento ontológico de un nosotros el pueblo. Eh, existe una, un intervalo, existe una brecha sin rellenar entre el estar juntos y el nosotros, el pueblo, una brecha entonces que nos recuerda que esta última categoría, el pueblo, no responde a algo dado, sino a algo que se autoconstituye en base a lo que polémicamente nombra, delimita o representa esta categoría. Y entonces Judith Butler nos enseña que lo no totalizable, lo no totalizable de esta condición nunca puede perderse de vista, porque esto no totalizable es lo que contiene, no es cierto, la clave del por qué la relación entre autodeterminación, soberanía popular y democracia es una relación desajustada una relación excedida, una relación imperfecta y siempre impugnable. Y tal como hablamos de revueltas, hablamos de pandemias y hablamos entonces de las lecciones de pobreza y de miseria, ¿no es cierto?, que ha puesto al descubierto el reviente económico-social desatado por el virus. Y nunca está de más recordar que la formulación que le dio hace varios años ya Judith Butler a la categoría de precariedad eh, es hoy una categoría forjada por ella eh, que se ha vuelto completamente universal y a la vez imprescindible esta categoría, la de precariedad, para diagnosticar los distintos estados de de fragilización de los cuerpos y de las existencias, ¿no es cierto?, eh, bajo el auge neoliberal. Entonces, eh, ella ha reflexionado de manera muy temprana sobre la distinción entre aquellas vidas humanas que son consideradas válidas, consistentes, y que son consideradas valiosas, preciadas, ¿no es cierto?, merecedoras de respeto y de cuidado, mientras las otras vidas que son improductivas, que son desechables, residuales, etcétera, son objeto de desprecio y exclusión. Y estas apreciaciones de Butler son absolutamente clave en el contexto que nos envuelve. Eh, y bueno, y por toda esa razón y mucha más, muchas más razones, Quiero decir que es un placer y también es un honor poder contar con la presencia, de, aunque virtual, de Judith Butler 
en esta cátedra y creo que todos los que estamos reunidos en esta pantalla y quienes nos escuchan celebramos su valentía intelectual a la hora de tejer una relación entre el afecto y el juicio y cómo ella, desde ahí, desde esa relación entre el afecto y el juicio, fortalece una práctica crítica de índole ética y política. Así que muchas gracias, Judith, y muy bienvenida. Well, thank you very much, Nelly. Uh, it's one of the great pleasures in my life that I have um, come to know you and to read you. And this event means um, a great deal to me. It's uh, it's a friendship and a solidarity that I I value enormously. I am pleased to be here today, and I thank Nelly Richard for including me in her program. I am pleased to be here, although that phrase gives me pause. I am here in California and not there with you in Madrid. And yet part of what this Zoom world does is to cross the distance with impossible speed, with no time to adjust to the context, to let the context enter into what is said. So perhaps we should, from the outset, acknowledge that this connection, as lucky as it is, does not come without a sense of loss. Bodies are scattered and contained. The tired body, mine, the effort to remember how to speak words in Spanish, the hotel room, the adjustment to the time zones, that is not here. This body is not there, which is to say that we lost the body in transport, and that we have now, here and now, a sudden transport, one that leaves the body in its place. And after we are finished talking, I will suddenly be alone in my study in California, and the connection between us will have ended abruptly. And you will be exactly where you are, and so though we have this quick and improbable digital transport into each other's rooms, we are not there and we are not even close. I understand the sudden joy of speaking to students in Moscow or Bologna made possible by Zoom or other platforms. <clears throat> it would have been difficult for me to go there. That would have increased my carbon footprint and perhaps I would have returned exhausted and in need of repair. But I want to insist that it matters that we speak and listen in proximity, for we are not the kinds of creatures who simply relay information, for whom the media does not matter, the mode of speaking, the relation, and mode of address. When we speak, we take in the gestures we see always from one angle or another, and there is no one frame, so, and no single way to listen. We also relate to each other's speaking, or I do. There's usually the person in the back, the one who walked out angrily, the one who tried to get too close. In other words, a museum like Rena Sofia is a place where we inhabit space with strangers and navigate proximity with those whose names we do not know. We have that still here and now, whatever here and now may be, since I do not know your names, and even if I were to find them on the chat, I would not hear you pronounce or sign your own name. So let us begin by thanking the technology and those who have worked to prepare this connection, the one that lets this conversation happen. Even as I acknowledge that for me, there is the sudden thrill of being in contact far away, this, count this encounter is also 
uh, marked by the loss of proximity. All the ways we make contact with one another in spaces meant for gathering. Scattering and containment. Public space is the space of proximity with those who, for the most part, we do not know, but with whom we find ourselves sharing a structured space, a set of passages, an entire infrastructure for the senses in the context of unexpected and anonymous bodily proximity. For we not only see the other who is walking, seeing, listening, but the wall against which they stand, the sound to which they listen, or the passage through which they walk. We see them in an object world that shapes them for our perception, but also constitutes the infrastructural mode of their appearance, mobility, stasis, and gesture. We are with them, sensing what they see, and we are aware that others are sensing as well. The objects and installations unfold sensuously to all of us within this structure. Here, the scene behind me, is my study. It contains my books, the old ones. I believe that is Freud on my right shoulder, a little heavy today. <laughs> and to the left are books from the 19th 80s and 90s on radical democratic theory, democratic socialism, the transformation of the public sphere. These are the dustier books, the ones you cannot examine too closely, the ones that in some cases are familiar to me, carrying some part of my history. The scene is personal, but the personal is taken out of view. This is a live image that takes place against a scene of restriction and relative isolation. So not quite a living image, one that has been stilled for you instead. It is one that is arrested for the purposes at hand, one that takes the place of the museum where I had hoped to be in Spain. So what you see as well is movement that was not possible, the vast distance between us, and even the not knowing when it will become possible for any of us, especially at my age, to cross that distance. It is not prison, no, and those who say it is have forgotten or never known what prison is. I said I would speak today about fragments and poems, but I only begin to approach those issues in what I will say. My topic will be slogans, repeated and animated <clears throat> political language, and the struggle against right-wing nationalism in the United States and elsewhere. I do not have poems or poetic fragments but I do have phrases and sentences, the ones that express and activate solidarity because they cross time and space in not fully predictable ways. The form of right-wing mania in the United States right now is bound up with an ideology of individualism, which is certainly part of the capitalist legacy and takes particular forms under the intensified form of neoliberalism and its pervasive practices of economic abandonment that have suffused and undermined everyday forms of life. On the one hand, those who represent that individualism most aggressively insist that adopting protocols of social distancing or wearing a mask under pandemic conditions constitute restrictions on their personal liberty. 
and they rail against the regulations that would make it obligatory to wear a mask or keep their distance. On the other hand, these defenders of individual freedom express their sense of national belonging, of nationalism, through their resistance to social regulations. If they want to get sick, they argue that is their choice, their individual right. If they want to spread the virus, as Trump has just done, and continues to do through his super-spreading actions, shamelessly, then that is also their personal right. Indeed, Trump's actions function as an allegory for a broader governmental policy to accept the preventable deaths of a large number of people, that is, to refuse to prevent those deaths. Masculine defiance in the face of death, one's own and others, couples with the neoliberal policies of abandonment that let people die rather than spend government funds on accessible and decent health care. The point is not simply that Trump and his followers risk their own lives and the lives of others with their decisions and actions, but that they actually act in conformity with a neoliberal version of national identity which accepts that people will die and takes no preventive action to stop that dying. If they were really individuals, they might depart from this national chant and rant, but no, they chant and rant together. And in the chant that asserts their individuality, they lose their individuality. Against state restrictions on large gatherings, they invoke their freedom, identifying lockdown as state subjection. And they love their leader because he embraces the contradiction. I stand for law and order. I break the law and thrive on creating disorder. We can call their responses necropolitical exhilaration. Some of the right-wing signs read, liberate Virginia, and others say, don't tread on me, or give me back my civil liberties, expressing the libertarian strain of U.S. fascism. One of the most interesting slogans, lock her up, emerged in the context of a protest against Governor Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan, who imposed tight public safety regulations. They want her to be imprisoned for having imposed legal restrictions on their civil liberties, and they attack her as a woman, recycling with sadistic glee the chant that Trump invoked against Hillary Clinton in 2016. The thrill of putting the woman in jail, the thrill of putting women in jail, because she regulates public space to secure public health, or because she used her private email. They hate government regulations, but they apparently love the thought of prison, women in prison, the most violent domestic institution of the state. Of course, now there is a counter chant on the left, lock him up. And it could happen that Trump loses the election and goes to jail because of his financial crimes. Let us hope that maybe that does happen. Reversing the chant is exhilaration for the left. I like the idea for sure. But just reversing the affect does not exactly take into account what prison is 
and how it functions in U.S. history as a primary instrument of anti-Black violence and injustice. That question has been at the center of Black Lives Matter, the most revolutionary movement in the United States right now, and to which I will shortly return. In, um, okay, of course, we have reason to worry about the intensification of surveillance capitalism during COVID times, and there are many reasons not to trust the state with the powers of public health. We have seen how Romania, Hungary, Panama have all used new state powers over public health to deny rights to trans people and to renew the mandate for women to become identified primarily as unpaid domestic workers. It serves as well neoliberal and authoritarian regimes like Chile's Piñeras to shut down public gatherings by invoking public health and to suspend the process of rewriting the Constitution that holds the promise, finally, to take out the dictatorial residues that remain active and lethal throughout that legal regime. For the fascist streak in U.S. politics and for neo-fascist leaders like Bolsonaro, the aim is precisely to refuse the health regulations and to position themselves outside and against the law, instituting a lethal, that is, death-dealing form of masculinity. One of the most popular slogans on the right is, no more fear, which suggests that those who seek to safeguard the lives of one another are motivated by care, a feminine virtue, a demasculinizing practice, and fear defined as a lack of sufficient masculinity. How odd for me, whose book Sin Miedo appears in Spanish recently, in which women and LGBTQ peoples, migrants, are fighting their exclusion and their deaths through networks of solidarity that seek to overcome fear, the fear of the police, the fear of detention, the fear of prison, the fear of violence. And yet here, the slogan belongs to the right. Their message is, do not fear your death, affirm your freedom. Do not fear endangering others, affirm your freedom. Do not honor any social bonds of care, assert your freedom. Those who argue against social regulations on the right argue that they do not need to be protected by the government since protection is state control and their right understood as a masculine power to protect themselves, is ultimately expressed by their constitutional right to bear arms, to use guns, to have guns as their personal property, and to wield them as they please. It is this conviction of the right, which is basically a militia conviction, right? The right to become a militia, it is this conviction of the right that serves as the, affect of the affective center of right-wing militias in the U.S., the necropolitical exhilaration that justifies and motivates in their minds the attacks on migrants at the border, the attack on protesters in Portland. They take the law into their own hands, just like the Border Patrol. In fact, the same groups that harass, beat, and detain migrants traveled north to do the same to protesters against racism in Portland. These events are new and not new at the same time. 
I would not say that what happens in these cases is the exact same as the slaughter of indigenous people that serves as the foundation of the United States, the one that took place as part of the European colonial expansion in North America. Nor would I say that what happens now is the exact same as lynching and yet the crushed neck of George Floyd recalls the crushed necks of all those black people lynched throughout the history of this country over here. Both of these violent histories are renewed in the present, not only in action, gesture, and voice, but also condensed into the slogans that we hear and that revitalize genocidal origins and brutal enslavements, the spirit of white supremacy, the active trace of those memories renewed in contemporary forms of lethal necropolitical exhilaration. In the course of the pandemic, we have all had to ask who is more likely to become ill and die, who is more likely to receive the care that they require. In the United States, it is the black and brown communities, those who have been deprived of accessible and affordable health care, who are more likely to succumb to the virus. And there are at least two reasons for this. One is the absence of a national health care system that would guarantee health care to all inhabitants of the country, whether documented or not. <clears throat> the other is a long history of discrimination on the part of health care institutions against racial minorities, which not only makes those institutions unaffordable, but also untrustworthy. The pre-existing conditions that make some more vulnerable than others are created by repeated and systemic maltreatment over time. They are only pre-existing from the point of view of the present. They are the effects of systemic maltreatment seen from the point of view of the history of racial injustice. Under pandemic conditions, the exclusion of millions of people from health care coverage means that U.S. health policy, driven by profit, accepts that many will die, and they will be the poor and the working class, those who cannot afford health care. So this is but one of the predominant ways that people are left to die without intervention and without any state remorse. And the vast majority of those are people of color. So racism and the necropolitics of letting die work together to institute a form of death dealing that exists prior to and outside the pandemic, but is now intensified by the pandemic. The resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement in the last months has taken place against this background, but also in light of a relentless series of attacks against Black people by police that have resulted in maiming or death. Some say that the disproportionate number of those who have died from COVID among minority communities, taken together with the explicit police killings of Black men and women, are dueling disasters, disasters in conflict with one another, two forms of death dealing that are difficult to register and oppose at the same time. And yet, the term systemic racism is meant to show that these two forms of death dealing are connected and that there are different ways of disposing with a population, including, by the way, imprisonment. Imprisonment under COVID conditions transmutes every sentence into a potential death sentence. <clears throat> 
And in the United States, the vast number of people in prison are black and brown men where they are deprived of voting rights in most cases and deprived of citizenship. And as Angela Davis has pointed out, they are sent back, as it were, to a time and space before the abolition of slavery. It is one reason many people argue that the abolition of slavery will only come to an end with the abolition of prisons. Those high rates of incarceration for black and brown people mean that they are more likely to contract COVID and not get decent health care. If the prison was not a killing machine before, it is certainly part of the death apparatus that deals death in different ways. Letting die and killing are two modalities of death dealing, and they work together. Black Lives Matter is both a movement and a slogan, one that continues to be chanted on the street along with the names of all those who have been killed by police violence. I would like to consider the way that Black Lives Matter functions as an archive in the way that Nelly Richard has helped us to understand. In a recent interview, Nelly describes the importance of the archive of memories as they enter into revolt and resistance. She is describing the experience of the April 2019 insurgents of radical democratic demands in Chile, which were suddenly brought to a halt by the pandemic-based restrictions on public gathering. She writes, and I quote, <clears throat> I use the word archive in relation to the revolt in the sense of a reservoir of recorded remnants, events, dreams, experiences, knowledge, passions, etc., that I think we should be able to hold in our memory. When I say hold, Nelly continues, I mean that we should hang on to or take care of memory that should remain available. Now there is no way in Chile to channel the energy that drove that revolt towards a public expression so that we can reinterpret it later. I say, Nelly says, reinterpret because it implies a gesture more complex than simply recovering or using it. The archive, she, she writes, she says, is about material contained in a documentary source that preserves the traces of what has been recorded. It prevents the destruction of its power and of its latency. By latency, I mean, Nelly means, that which mediates between the traces of the past and its future conversion into new forms that will transfigure its memory. This is why it is important to ensure that the repertory of practices and knowledge embodied during the revolt does not disappear, while also recognizing that the reemergence of forces will be different from the events of the uprising in October 2019 because it will necessarily contain the traces of this confusion. This confusion has to do with the collision, back to me, this confusion has to do with the collision and incommensurability of two different temporal experiences of uprising, each of which subject to political attacks on the memory of struggle. Public efforts to control and prohibit ways of marking and valuing the history of radical democratic mobilization. Now, in the lull in this 
troubling and suspended political time, the disparate histories of anti-fascist resistance, temporally discrete, come together in a contemporary constellation. A constellation holds images of different times together, provides a spatial form for time, one in which there is no relation of causality, but rather a repeated interruption of a potentially revolutionary moment. The former one remains an archive for the latter, which means that it is retained and transformed, but also reanimated for fresh purposes and new directions. But here we can ask a question that Marx posed. Is the past reanimated by present uprisings? And if so, how? Or is it rather that the past resides in memory, understood not only as a cognitive faculty, but as a trace, a cluster of traces, animated as an archive, and that these take form, take shape, in the course of an effectively animated transmission and communication. The traces of the past are animated in a handing down or a handing over from one time to another, and this is at once conscious and visceral, deliberate and unconscious. As such, it is part of what we mean by the act of care by which memory is sustained, but also a shared history which marks and leaves its time and place so that this history rises up when we rise up. We can place the agentic human at the center of the scene and say, we call upon our past as we rise up now. Or we can understand that the past, which needs to be taken care of, rises up precisely because of that care. Caring for the past, waiting for the moment in which its latent potential can be expressed. And that is and is not a deliberate choice. For the past is also what forms us, even as we call upon it. It acts on us and incites us to action. This is a paradox, but a promising one. Black Lives Matter works both as a slogan and as a name for a movement because it insists upon the acknowledgement that black lives have not mattered, that they can be dispensed with easily and as a matter of course, and they can be killed with impunity. Police are able, time and again, to claim self-defense on spurious grounds or insist that they used legitimate force in a tautological argument. Police do not use violence, but only legitimate force. That's what they say. Now, every time a black life is taken by police, thousands of people take to the street. There is no loss of black life by police violence right now without exposing and opposing that violence, without a crowd that gathers in one way or another to expose and oppose that violence. Without mourning that life and calling for justice. At the same time, Black Lives Matter has called attention to scholarly work on slavery and reparations, to the history of lynching and its modern variants. It is a movement that calls upon the civil rights movements of the 1960s, and though equality is still at the center of its claims, equality now refers to the equal value of lives. This equality is not the formal equality of laws, though that remains important. This equality has to be understood through the calculus of mattering. 
If black lives do not matter, they can be dispensed with easily or killed with impunity. The same can be said about the lives of migrants abandoned at sea by the European Union, which is why migrants' lives matter, calls upon uh, the U.S. movement, invokes it, and makes that link of solidarity. Migrants are left to die, or their deaths are not a matter, an issue, for European authorities, precisely because they do not matter, have value. This is also the case in the U.S., where migrants on the border become dispensable lives, lives whose dispensability is made all the more clear under pandemic conditions where the shelters cannot accommodate any safety protocols. To say that Black Lives Matter is to seek to focus public attention on the living materiality of the body, but also the dead body that deserves to be openly mourned. It makes sense in a world in which some lives are very grievable, which means they would be actively and publicly mourned were they to be lost, but other lives are considered ungrievable while alive, meaning that they do not bear enough value to be safeguarded. They are, in some sense, already lost before they are lost, ungrievable because they are not grasped as a living life, a life with value. Although the demand for equality links the civil rights movement with the movement for black lives, the sense of equality has changed. It is against the calculus that values some lives more than others, the calculus that lets some lives die, die or takes those lives violently and lets others live, those who can afford to buy into a healthcare system that assumes the inevitable loss of black and brown life and brings about those very losses. I've suggested that the right, the reactionary right where I live, uses the language of freedom and liberation, stands for freedom against equality, religious freedom, personal freedom, individual freedom, which is paradoxically a variant of nationalism and an attack on anyone who would separate from that norm. One problem with the scenario is that the language of liberation has been appropriated by the right, as has the language of freedom. And freedom and equality have been, to some extent, set against one another in contemporary politics. And if we consider the term life, we see that the right talks about the right to life, monopolizing that term, and yet the language of Black Lives Matter introduces life in its plural form, lives. So the problem for us is not only how to sustain and reanimate a history of left activism and even revolution, but how to negotiate a terrain in which we have lost both freedom and life to the right. Is the task to take those terms back? Is the task to renew an older sense of freedom and a politics of life for the left? To use Nelly Richard's terms, what is the archive that must live for us now? The problem is not only that the history of resistance and revolution has been interrupted by authoritarian or fascist powers, or neoliberal ones that reformulate fascism for, its own, for their own purposes. No, the problem is also that our language, the most mobilizing and valued of our signifiers, have also been appropriated along with the powerful affects that reside there. <clears throat> 
You may remember Marx's essay on the 18th Brumaire, a reflection on a revolutionary situation that should have been a success for the proletariat, but turned direction and became a win for the bourgeois property holders who were led by um, Bonaparte. Marx asks himself, what motivates politi people politically in such instances? What emerges from the past to claim and redirect their desire? What freedom do people have to make their own history? And famously, he writes, people write their own history, but not exactly as they please. They do not have full control over the historical circumstances under which they act, nor do they fully understand the history that works in them, that acts upon them when they act. Those circumstances are found, they are given, but, he adds, they are also transmitted. In some ways, Marx's essay on the 18th Brumaire concentrates on the problem of transmission, the transmission of the past. What does it mean? How does it work? Then comes the strong claim, graphic, even alarming. The tradition, he writes, of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. So precisely at the moment of making something new, people conjure up the spirits of the past to their service, borrowing their names, their slogans, their costumes. They present the present through the language and the symbols of the past. Why do they do this? And is this act of conjuring fully within their control? Is it intentional? Is it history that weighs upon them, exerting a force that is not precisely fully chosen, that is against their will? After all, Marx has started with the notion that we are not as free to make our history as we might think. But what is it that limits that freedom? And what is that counter trend that moves us in another direction, sometimes backward? Sometimes he describes history as a weight that we carry. Other times it seems to be a reverse direction. Although it seems that Marx is trying to understand how Bonaparte borrows the language and slogans of Napoleon, it turns out that Napoleon, before him, was doing the same thing, borrowing Roman costumes from antiquity to let his followers believe that grandeur was returning to them. Paradoxically, Bonaparte was imitating an imitation in order to set up a bourgeois society and expand property relations, dismantle the remnants of the feudal order, and establish conditions for the expansion of a market economy and the accumulation of profits. He was also stopping a proletariat revolution. Something about the heroism of the past was needed to install this new economic condition. The awakening of the dead glorified these new struggles. Marx is trying to fathom how history that should be moving forward moves backward, how progress gets undone by regress. What he gets close to understanding, and perhaps this is his most psychoanalytic essay, is that historical progress cannot be assumed, that different historical temporalities come to converge on the present, limiting and structuring human aspirations and longings, informing and constraining their very sense of freedom, their sense of what they can do. Why, Marx asks, would people long for a return to the age of despots when a different kind of revolution was possible, one that would free the future from the past, 
create social and economic equality, and enhance the powers of political self-determination for the people, the working people. Despite his ironic delivery, Marx is appalled by the success of the bourgeois revolution and seeks an even more radical rupture from the past. But then, I think, he makes an error, for he comes to fear the power of the past. He writes, the social revolution of the 19th century cannot draw its poetry from the past, but only from the future. Well, is this true, or is it only partially true? Marx believes that whenever the past throws up such ghosts, the proletariat revolution will be suspended or reversed. Marx longs for a radical rupture, poet poetry that will not recall the past. Once awakened, the past will dominate and reverse proletarian aspirations for a new future. But what if there are traces from the past that reanimate precisely such struggles? It would have been good if Marx could have had a conversation with Nelly Richard, but that could not have happened. If it could, then perhaps there would be a conversation about Walter Benjamin's theses on the philosophy of history, where we, are, where we come to understand how the vanquished can in some sense rise again in a new social movement. Marx's, Marx's advice is, let the dead bury the dead. Apparently, in his view, the living should be liberated from the task of burying the dead. But did Marx consider that the ghosts from the past could also accompany and move us in revolutionary ways, providing links of solidarity across time and place? What about all those who were left to die or killed by police force, or who were disappeared? Do they not revisit us as we struggle to affirm the equal value of all lives, the equal grievability of all lives? Marx, of course, thinks brilliantly about those slogans that incite people, the images of wealth and power. And of these, he writes, there the phrase went beyond the content. Here the content goes beyond the phrase. There the phrase went beyond the content. Here the content goes beyond the phrase. The phrase that is meant for one historical purpose is taken up for another, and in this sense it abandons one content while it acquires another. But the content, in his view, goes beyond the phrase, by which he means that the older content persists in a ghostly fashion. Something from the past refuses to stay dead. Marx appears to want us to get rid of those ghosts that would interrupt revolutionary progress, but he forgot that we carry forward the demand for justice that the dead can no longer carry. He forgot that our mourning is bound up with our rage, and it fuels revolutionary desire. Did he forget that the past can furnish revolutionary ideals linking one struggle with another, surviving denial and censorship? My sense is that the prior ideals in his view were all partial and incomplete, and that only through a future poetry, radically ruptured from the past, could the, our values finally be freed of the weight of history and the regressive power of ghosts. My own view is that the ongoing struggle over the relationship between slogans and ideal is one that is never settled. And one reason it is a struggle is because we are struggling for histories to be known. We are struggling for the permission to narrate, 
We are fighting against the oblivion that would deny the relationship of past and present struggles. It is made all the more difficult now when they steal our slogans and appropriate our language. This struggle over appropriation and definition is now part of the political struggle for our times. Consider that feminism has faced this problem for a long time. If one reason we are in favor of reproductive rights is that the lives of women matter, the lives of all those, regardless of gender, who require reproductive freedom for their lives. If abortion is outlawed in the United States, we will see women, especially poor women, resort to informal and back alley practices, and that will take them back in time when having an abortion put one's own life at risk. In France and elsewhere, the arguments against feminism, against feminists who oppose rape, harassment, and discrimination, they are often formulated in the language of freedom. The opposition to sexual harassment is understood as, by anti-feminists as a restriction imposed on the sexual freedom of straight men. But what about the sexual freedom of women who want to walk down the street without fear, who want to express their viewpoints to their partners without fear of battery? Feminism is not anti-sexual. Feminism insists on the right and power to live one's sexual life freely, in freedom, without fear of violence and discrimination. And yet time and again, these basic concepts of democracy, equality and freedom, but also justice, are subject to a polysemic play that can work against us. And this means that we have to struggle to seize and redirect the sign. The right-wing militias who oppose the mask do not want the law to regulate their bodies. The echo with feminism is odd and disturbing, but that may be because both sometimes subscribe to notions of personal liberty at the expense of ideals of social freedom. In any case, it is not possible to outlaw policy me. Policy me sets the limit on the power of those we oppose as well as our own linguistic power. We will have to allow the archive of resistance and revolution to animate the shifting sign. To do that, we have to live the politics and passion of language as if our lives depended on it. Finally then, we talk about slogans that appear in crowds, but slogans circulate without their crowds, or sometimes on the internet, the slogan conjures the crowd that was and the demonstration to come. They continue to gather us even as we cannot always gather. The streets are empty, but there are people in the streets. The streets are empty, but there are new networks of solidarity among shelters and on the internet across regions and languages, and they flare with speed and excitement. The streets are empty, but people keep their distance, and gathering now takes a new form. They are walking and chanting, bodies in motion, living still, living on, vocalizing, letting the matter of the body stand and sound forth. The demonstrations are said to be gone, yet they are happening everywhere. Everywhere has become the new stage. The rage is reignited and the exhaustion deepens. From what source then do we find renewal and repair? Sometimes a phrase disconnected from its context travels to another place inciting a sense of justice or aspiration. The phrase has perhaps lost its history or it carries the echo of a history that cannot be recovered or it acquires a new history. 
consider the Palestinian statement, we exist, exclamation point, which fights a pervasive negation of their history, their land, and their rights. It echoes with Black Lives Matter and Migrant Lives Matter and with survivors of sexual or gender violence. It is in and through these echoes that new solidarities are forged across time and space. Consider the Chilean feminist song Un Violador en Tu Camino, created by the feminist collective Las Tesis, as it left its context and its history to travel elsewhere. As it traveled, it carried that history and linked it with other histories converging with other times and places where history and futurity both emerge at once, inciting feminist activists in Turkey, India, and Lebanon with its rhythm and power. The phrase goes beyond the content. The content goes beyond the phrase. The language we use recalls the forms of resistance and solidarity that were vanquished but can be renewed, and as they are renewed, in a new space and time, a future opens, a link is made, a solidarity is expanded and strengthened. We sing and chant across the borders and in defiance of them. The songs we sing, the poems we recite are ones that others have sung and recited before, and the voice is then never exclusively one's own and yet they become new and open up the new as they move and live elsewhere. The solidarity that emerges across time and space is both the ghost and the poetry of the future. A voice resounding from another time inside our own voice, an alliance of the living and the dead, all of us grievable, all of us mattering, an ideal of equality, living and breathing, living and breathing more and still. Thank you very much. Me parece que no es casualidad que el libro que acabamos de publicar en eh, de los materiales de la cátedra de políticas estéticas de la memoria del año pasado lleve ese título, no tiempos incompletos, para pensar de qué manera. Eh, todas esas dimensiones del pasado están inscriptas, latentes y operando sobre el presente y sobre las posibilidades mismas de futuro. Me parece que ahí hay un engarce muy, muy hermoso y muy potente que se da en el, entre el pensamiento de, de ambas. ¿no? Y particularmente eh, me pareció muy, muy sugerente también el modo en que Judith planteaba esta noción de archivo, recuperando esta idea de archivo vital, que viene planteando Nelly, como un archivo obviamente no cerrado, no completo, no capturado, ni, ni, ni inaccesible, sino como el archivo mismo de la experiencia que estamos atravesando, y que es un archivo que se activa a partir de, de legados, de retazos, de rastros, eh, también de, de negaciones y de, y de faltas, ¿no? pero un archivo que insiste, que insiste en, 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 en interpelarnos respecto de, de todo lo que porta de ese pasado en, en el presente, en el hoy, y también en las posibilidades mismas que tenemos de imaginar nuevas brechas o posibilidades de vida hacia adelante. ¿no? Eh, y en ese sentido, querría preguntarle a Judith por la imagen que nos sugirió para acompañar su conferencia, que es la imagen de un mural palestino, eh, nosotros resistimos, nosotros eh, existimos, ¿no? esta superposición entre existir y resistir, que está presente en, en muchos otros eh, movimientos y lemas en diferentes partes de, del mundo, en América Latina, en, en Europa, en Estados Unidos, ¿no? eh, existir y resistir, como ese modo en que en la existencia en presente tiene que ver con esa historia de resistencias, esas voces que vienen del pasado, y que también portamos. Y lo digo particularmente porque elegiste la imagen de Palestina antes de, de que ocurriera la pandemia, cuando ibas a venir a Madrid a dar tu conferencia presencialmente. Y creo que particularmente Palestina es hoy una de esas eh, situaciones 
o acontecimientos completamente negados, eh, en las que las propias condiciones de la pandemia han sido también eh, la posibilidad de un arrasamiento, de un aniquilamiento, de vidas que no se importan eh, y que de golpe han quedado eh, aún más invisibilizadas de la agenda pública ¿no? en medio de estas condiciones. Los bombardeos eh, y las, eh, el recrudecimiento de las condiciones de hostilidad y de imposibilidad de, de vida en el territorio palestino, me parece que vuelve la imagen que elegiste todavía más eh, potente ¿no? en relación a las condiciones del presente. Esa sería la primera pregunta que me gustaría hacerte. Um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry that my talk was a little long. I, uh, I wanted to go slowly. <laughs> so that people could understand me. Um, uh, and I, I hope that that did work. Um, uh, well, you know, um, the, the issue of Palestine is huge because, um, of course, in the early Zionist writings, um, the, the area of Palestine was described as um, a land without a people. And of course, there were people there, um, but it was described as a land without a people because the people who were there didn't really count. They were vaguely described as Bedouins or they were understood as nomads or they didn't really uh, register to the, the Zionist settlers as inhabitants of the land who had history and culture and life there. Um, And so there was always a, a kind of blurry sense that, oh, maybe there were some people wandering through, but there was no sense of deep or profound belonging. And in fact, um, once one really comes to understand um, Palestinian culture and history, you see how profound the link is between Palestinian life and the land and, and the trees and... and um, And, and what the, and how identity is actually forged in that relationship, uh, especially the olive trees and the and the rivers. Um, so uh, so there is that. But then, of course, um, there are these historical arguments. There are, there's no such thing as the Palestinian people. They are just a mix of people from different areas. They don't constitute a nation. Right? And the and the whole reason to argue that way is that if they were a people, they could have a nation, they could have a state like any other people. So these scholarly, these very falsifying, brutal scholarly efforts to say there are no Palestinian people or they are not a people is another form of negation. But negation also then takes place through detention and imprisonment and, um, and the appropriation of land and the appropriation of housing and Um, uh, forced exile. Uh, those are all forms of negation in action. So we, we could come up with an entire constellation of forms of negation that would explain what Palestinians have to fight for. Um, but what's important to note is that they're not a constituted subject in the sense that they're not perceived as a political subject. And part of the attack on them is an attack on the very effort to establish themselves as political actors and who, who are entitled to political self-determination, uh, which is why their very existence is continually uh, called into question in that way. Um, to say we exist, we resist, we resist, we exist, is to say that to assert existence under these conditions is a form of resistance and that part of the oppression that they suffer is precisely the denial of their existence, their history, and the actual displacement of their people as, as well as um, the death of so many people by military force, the detention and death of so many people. So, um, so, so these, these issues are, I think, profoundly, profoundly linked. Gracias, Judith. 
Sí, tu conferencia se, se pudo seguir eh, muy bien, muy, muy, muy amablemente, así que muchas gracias por leerla lentamente. Eh, la segunda pregunta que me gustaría hacerte tiene que ver con esa conexión que haces entre las vidas negras importan, eh, en tanto movimiento y también en tanto lema, esa doble condición, y también en tanto archivo vital, un archivo que, que se activa colectivamente. Y pensaba, en, por un lado, en la conexión con el movimiento Ni Una Menos, eh, que, en, que en Argentina y en otras partes del mundo me parece que ha sabido también tener esa doble dimensión de ser un movimiento y un lema. Y también en el ejemplo que acabas de mencionar de la performance de las tesis del colectivo chileno, en la medida en que ahí lo que hay es una diseminación de una conexión entre eh, la teoría feminista con los modos de la performance activista callejera que se reverbera, resuena y se retoma en diferentes contextos del mundo. ¿no? Me parece que hay algo de esa dimensión de movimiento y de lema que también se puede trasladar a ciertas prácticas del movimiento feminista. Um, yes, I, I think it's very important and thank you for bringing up um, Niuna Menos. Um, they have they have changed my way of thinking, uh, uh, and they have brought me back to feminism in, in a way that I did not know I could be. So I'm very grateful to them. Um, uh, but yes, let's think about that. The slogan, uh, not one less, not one less will be taken, not one less will be lost, not one, not one less. We will lose not one uh, more. And um, And that is uh, that's that is a, a a verbal utterance of defiance and of intention. Uh, it will not happen again. Uh, no one else will be subject to this violence. Uh, maybe it's an impossible one, but it's an impossible one that activates uh, this call to justice and this exposure of a massively systemic violence um, against women and trans people. And, Um, un, an unbelievably deep-seated and naturalized violence. Um, so uh, the call, ni una menos, the assertion, the utterance, is the movement. Um, it's, not a, it's not an organization that has a settled identity and then it takes certain actions, right? <laughs> it's not like a, um, you know, it's not an identitarian movement in the, in the usual sense, like, Oh, this is who we are. Let's which what let's let's do this one action. It is an action. In other words, we have to actually understand it as an organization in movement, an organization in action, and that the verbal form, the utterance, the call, the demand is what activates every aspect of its uh, mobilization. So it's a way of naming mobilization in language and keeping language mobile, keeping it active, keeping the claim alive as the central feature. It's, a, it's also a way of, I think, resisting more uh, conventional forms of institutionalizing political parties or political organizations. It's, it's not quite that. It is on the move and it is saying something. Um, so it gives it a, a linguistically active and mobilizing character. And it is, it also produces a kind of effect. I mean, who thought we could call for this? Who thought that others would hear this? Uh, we've been living with this for so long and yet, and it, it's taken for granted. Women are killed here. Trans people are killed there. It's part of the news. It gets taken for granted and to say to break through that taken for granted character and say no more uh, not again not one not one less we will not lose one more that that was enormously powerful and i think throughout the world that has reverberated even if the situations are not the exact same right in turkey or italy or spain that they have heard it and they have transposed it into their own and it works. So it's terribly important. Muchas gracias. Eh, una última pregunta antes de darle la palabra a Nelly. Eh, 
eh, cuando mencionabas la frase de Marx en torno a dejemos que los muertos entierren a los muertos, eh, pensé inmediatamente en el contexto actual de la pandemia y en cómo se han interrumpido eh, las ritualidades del duelo, eh, la posibilidad de acompañamiento al moribundo y de consuelo a los, a los deudos, ¿no? a partir de las condiciones eh, pandémicas. Y pensaba en que esa frase, en vez de hablar del pasado, estaba hablando del presente, de los muertos presentes y de los muertos futuros, y de cómo eh, esta situación traumática que estamos viviendo en todo el mundo, sin duda, va a instalar otras, eh, otras condiciones para imaginar la vida y también la muerte. Entonces te quería preguntar si tenías alguna reflexión al respecto, respecto de, eh, de que los muertos no son asunto del pasado, sino más bien de nuestro presente más inmediato, en cuanto a su abandono también. Eh, para um, volver sobre las vidas que importan, diría también las muertes que importan. It's such a huge issue for so many of us because many people are dying under conditions of terrible isolation. And those who would mourn them, those who would comfort them are kept at a terrible distance. So you say your final words to somebody over, over Zoom or somebody's holding up a phone. I mean, it's a massive mm -hmm. sorrow. It's unbearable. Um, and we have been deprived of mm -hmm. both the, the intimate uh, act of caring for the dead and the pu public act of mourning the dead, mm -hmm. including those uh, those we know and those we do not know. Um, and that leaves us, I think, in a state of fragmented, uh, fragmented and dissociated uh, uncertainty and melancholia, uh, where we are not sure uh, whether lives matter or don't matter, if they're, if they're being If bodies are being piled up and transported, are they just uh, objects to be transported? Have they become industrial waste? What is the, what, where is the the dignity? Uh, where is the um, the connection to the dead? So, I do think people are um, trying as they can to find rituals of mourning. But I am, or well, I certainly live in a country uh, where the government refuses any act of public mourning zero. It would be unmanly. It would be unthinkable. Um, I think other people are doing it. I believe Black Lives Matter is both a public act of mourning and a public act of protest and shows us the link between the dignity of mourning, the justice of mourning, and the, and the justice of, um, of ra radical protest against racism and police violence. They are, they are, they are linked. This life should not have died. We mourn this life. This life should not have died. It was unjust that this life died. The mourning and the and the claim of injustice work together, and all too often that is true when we see how healthcare is organized and who whose lives can be more easily prevented from death than others. But I do believe we also live um, right now with ambient death. It's potential, it's recent, it's proximate, it's far away. There is no movement outside of the circuit of death. We are now mindful of death, of precarity and fragility in a different way. And I also believe that this can produce uh, an ethics and politics of care and solicitude, of solidarity, of concern, um, of Of, um, of, of even, I would say, of, of socialist ideals uh, where, where we are committed to a world in which we care for each other and where lives are equally deserving of shelter, of food, of, of, of good health care, of, of good education. I think there could be a different form of socialist um, uh, idealism uh, that comes out of this uh, if... Um, If, if we struggle to, to achieve that. Uh, the mindfulness of death is not, um, is not all bad. We, I think many people, especially in manic capitalism, seek to evade the thought of death and 
and yet it is with us, or they, they flee uh, the, the atrocities of the past in order to stay up or manic or something. But in fact, this is our history, this is our present. These, this is where we're living. And uh, we are in each other's hands in a different way. How someone acts towards me and how I act towards them is consideration of them as a living creature who deserves to live more, who, who, who deserves to live on, right? Uh, I, I don't want to be the source of taking their life. They don't want to be the source of taking my life. We act in such a way that we keep each other living. This is something that we can learn from this situation. What are, what are the social structures we need in order for that to become even more true, even outside of pandemic? Anyway, that's those are some of my my thoughts on this very very difficult topic. Antigone would disagree with Marx. Okay, I'm just saying Antigone would disagree with Marx. The dead should not be left to bury the dead. Nelly. Bueno, eh, primero agradecer a Judith por su tan lúcida y generosa conferencia. Eh, yo tenía pensado dos preguntas vinculadas a lo que ella llama los combates políticos. Una pregunta sobre emancipación y una pregunta sobre violencia. Eh, la primera pregunta, y la quiero vincular entre ellas, pero la voy a hacer las dos seguidas para que ella pueda moverse entre una y otra. En, la, en las marchas feministas hemos visto muchas consignas que dicen abajo el patriarcado, en los eh, escenarios de revueltas como el chileno, por ejemplo, hemos visto consignas que dicen fin al neoliberalismo. Entonces son consignas que funcionan, ¿no es cierto?, como vectores utópicos para movilizar fuerzas de cambio. Pero... Eh, Sabemos que es muy difícil imaginar una sociedad libre de conflicto y de antagonismo. Es muy difícil imaginar una temporalidad eh, pura, eh, la del corte, ¿no? una temporalidad limpia después del de patriarcado o después del de neoliberalismo y que no hay corte sin adherencias, sin sedimentaciones de poder. Entonces, esto significa que la emancipación no es nunca el final del trayecto, sino el trayecto mismo. Interrumpido mil veces, el trayecto mismo en su capacidad de sugerir modos de devenir otro ¿no? para el presente. Entonces, eh, bueno, y quizás no sé si Judith estaría de acuerdo, eh, si es que la emancipación no es un camino pre-trazado, predeterminado, que culmina en un desenlace único, quizás sea mejor hablar de prácticas emancipatorias. ¿no? Eh, que luchan contra eh, lo desigual, lo opresivo, pero que lo hacen de un modo discontinuo, ¿no? parcial, contingente. Entonces, bueno, la pregunta es cómo concibe ella una política emancipatoria en su, bueno, primero en la dialéctica orden, revuelta, restauración del orden, o bien aperturas y cierres, o bien fuerzas destituyentes y fuerzas o potencias instituyentes. Es decir, ¿cómo imaginas políticas emancipatorias en la capacidad que 
deberían tener para combinar o articular eh, aspiraciones de cambio con nuevos procesos de, subjetiviz de subjetivación política. Y lo relaciono eh, con el tema de la violencia, eh, porque justamente cuando hablamos de nuevos procesos de subjetivación política, tendríamos que preguntarnos qué es lo que los favorece y promueve y qué es lo que lo obstruye. Eh, algunos piensan, por ejemplo, en el caso chileno, la revuelta antineoliberal de octubre de 2019, se ha visto envuelta por una violencia inusitada. Eh, no estoy hablando solamente, aunque obviamente esto es lo más grave, porque es lo más determinante, de la violencia represiva de de los aparatos de Estado. Estoy hablando también de una violencia política que eh, algunas consideran un instrumento dotado de eficacia, eh, un instrumento que logra, ¿no es cierto?, mediante el susto, mediante la intimidación, lo que no se conseguiría pacíficamente para hacer ceder un sistema de, do de dominación. Sería dable pensar, por ejemplo, en Chile, que sin la violencia social que acompañó la revuelta, el gobierno de Piñera no se hubiese visto obligado a aceptar la fórmula del plebiscito nacional para la nueva constitución. Entonces, eh, bueno, Judith ha trabajado muy finamente y muy exigentemente el tema de la violencia desde lo que llamaríamos una ética del sujeto, ¿no? desde el dilema ético de saber cómo luchar contra las violencias que nos agreden, pero dice ella sin reiterar la acción fanática de lo que destruye o de lo que busca aniquilar el otro, ¿no? según una lógica de la guerra. Entonces, frente al recrudecimiento de la violencia, eh, me gustaría preguntarte, eh, bueno, ¿qué nuevas vueltas le has dado al tema de la violencia? ¿Qué tiene que decir al respecto el feminismo eh, en la dirección de habilitar, no es cierto, nuevos modos de subjetivación política que diseñen un mundo vivible? para todos. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nelly. Those are difficult questions. Uh, I feel like I have to go away for a couple of months and, and, and think about them and then come back and tell you. But no, I will do my best. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, I do think um, that It is very hard to liberate ourselves from the teleological view of history, in which history somehow progresses towards an end, and emancipation is the name of that end. And that's one reason that, that Marx was so disappointed and confused in the 18th Brumaire, because he had imagined that history would move towards a proletarian revolution, and here the proletariat were being bought off by bourgeois ideals and uh, ancient ideas of grandeur. It's like, what, what happened? It was, it was clearly in their interest and, and they, they did not seize the revolutionary moment in the way that he thought they, they, they would and should. Um, but he was, I think, there at least, working with the idea of a teleological history where history would progress perhaps through dialectical movements and some regression and some progression, but in the end, emancipation would be a state or a condition that would be achieved. Now, I think there are different parts of Marx and we could argue about that, but I think that conception is there in that essay. Um, I think that, um, you know, I see you, Nelly, as um, drawing on Walter Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of history and suggesting that what is sometimes called progress is actually the history of destruction. 
and that we need to be very careful with these notions of uh, progress that are um, taken over by technocratic, neoliberal capitalist modes or uh, that do not see the destruction that they cause, have caused, continue to cause. Um, so, um, and I also think uh, that uh, emancipation is not a, an end. It is, um, it is an ideal, it is an aspiration, it is um, an experience of transformation uh, and of overcoming that does happen. It happens in various contexts. People are emancipated, but emancipation does not mean that the history of pre-emancipation is therefore lost or that we have transcended it. Because the minute of transformation in one domain uh, highlights the fact that transformation has not happened in another domain. So, um, and we don't all, we're not all living in the tame, same temporal zones. We're not living the same histories. Um, the history of Palestine is not the history of Neonomenos, although they can speak to each other. The history of efforts at um, democratization um, uh, in Latin America or the history against um, uh, negationism or um, revisionism both um, is, is, is very different depending uh, where we're living, whether it's part of a Native American struggle or a struggle in Argentina against the history of dictatorship. But they link, um, as do many histories that are bound by settler colonial practices. Um, so I don't think there's one history. There's certainly not a monumental history. There are many histories. And there are emancipatory moments, practices, yes. I think there are, um, there's an emancipatory ethos. I think emancipation can be punctual. I think it can be protracted. I think it can be lost and renewed. It's fragile. It's not... Um, it's not an achievement like a work, like a monument that is like you have it. Um, all, all you need to do is is protect it from the weather. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't think it works quite like like that, and and maybe that's good, um, because it keeps it as a living problem. It's a living struggle. I think democracy is a living struggle, and I think that it does involve conflict and policy me, struggle over what is meant by freedom, what is meant by equality, what is meant by justice, which is not to say that all these things are relative. I actually don't think they are relative. I think, though, that there's a, a, a um, within the field of power, they take on certain terms, certain, certain meanings that have to be contested and that one has to fight for the definitions that one wants to see instantiated and institutionalized in the world. So um, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a happy pluralism policy me. It's a field of struggle. And, um, and I think that, I don't know, for a long time, the, the word freedom didn't include sexual freedom. And then sexual freedom meant the right to rape or it meant the right to be gay. And we had very different kinds of discourses emerging under that rubric at the same time um, by very different pe people who were trying to lay claim. Um, so um, we do have these, these, this problem. We will not get rid of this problem. But we can struggle for um, to overcome violence and to actualize freedom and equality on terms that are 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 not are, are are i would say radically democratic that is to say that do not depend on the disenfranchisement the disenfranchisement of others that are not in a logic where some achieve democratic rights at the expense of others so um i do i do accept that about the notion of political violence actually forcing a change in government or forcing a concession on the part of, of 
the Chilean government um, after October 2019. Um, I guess I would say the following. Um, I think it's important for mass movements to become ungovernable. Un ungovernable. It's a different, difficult to say even in English. Um, difficult to govern, impossible to govern, right? They're too large. They're too chaotic. They are everywhere. They are disrupting the way in which life goes on. They've taken over the streets. They've taken over the industries. They've stopped things from working. They, there is no gov governing under these conditions. So to produce conditions of ungovernability ungovern is to bring the government down because it can no longer do its job. Um, or it must rethink what it's doing in order to govern again. So there are ways of doing mass political protest and producing um, an ungovernable population, right, uh, that can stop a government, that, it, that can be nonviolent, that can be nonviolent, can be powerful and nonviolent. And the reason why that's important is because violence is never merely an instrument to the achieving of a certain end. Violence is also, whenever it enters the world, it takes on a life of its own and it makes the world more violent. And we can't control then how it gets taken up. Well, oh, they used it. It's legitimate. We can use it. It's legitimate. Or it produces an excitation about violence that exceeds the aims for which it was bound. So I accept that it has to be a really powerful movement that brings a government to its knees or that stops a government from working. Yes, but I believe that taking over the streets, well, look what, if Neil Menos has taken over streets throughout Latin America to the point where the police cannot guard the streets. The police have to be moved off the street. That is a beautiful, that's a beautiful act. That's a beautiful act, right? They have, they have produced their own protection. They have produced the public space and they have pushed the police away who have not been helping, who have been for the most part hurting. And that is a very, very powerful act. And it's a sustained act, right? Which has in fact compelled millions of people um, and has the power to transform uh, policy and law. So I, I understand that political violence is one way of becoming ungovernable. I would say that there are nonviolent powerful methods of becoming ungovernable and achieving very similar kinds of consequences. Muchísimas gracias, Judith y Nelly. Ha sido una conversación muy hermosa entre las dos y un potente cierre de este, de este ciclo de, de la Catra, esta nueva edición de la Catra Políticas y Estéticas de la Memoria, que nos deja llenas de preguntas, acuciantes y ganas de seguir pensando con otras, ¿no? Juntas. Eh, la, la Catra este año eh, es el segundo año que se realiza. Eh, incluyó este año un ciclo de cine, Las Revueltas de la Memoria, sobre la escena de la transición de la dictadura a la, a la postdictadura en Chile, Argentina y España. Incluyó un seminario maravilloso de Nelly en dos sesiones, en torno a los imaginarios de la revuelta, el archivo vital y la transfiguración de la experiencia a partir de la pandemia, contraponiendo estos dos momentos, ¿no? el de la revuelta en Chile eh, desde octubre del año pasado y el de... Eh, el ciclo de la pandemia que se abre a partir de marzo y cómo estas dos escenas están fuertemente imbricadas y concatenadas. Y finalmente esta preciosa conferencia de Judith Butler, a quien de nuevo le agradecemos muchísimo el honor de, de, de contar con sus palabras y con su pensamiento en acto y esperamos que sea la primera de muchas veces eh, y que la próxima vez sea presente con los cuerpos más próximos y y pensando de otras maneras más cálidas que, que esta distancia. Eh, también contarles que acaba de aparecer el libro, el pequeño libro que reúne eh, los materiales de la Catra del año pasado, va a estar en, disponible en PDF, en inglés y en castellano para descargar desde la web del museo, eh, y en unos pocos días, lo, antes de fin de mes, lo vamos a estar presentando con las autoras Nelly, Richard, 
eh, María Rosón y Maite Garballo, junto a otras personas que van a proponer una lectura de estos materiales que dan cuenta de una lectura feminista de la transición en Chile, Argentina y España. Eh, simplemente para cerrar esta, esta cátedra, también querría mencionar que además de estos eventos anuales, hay un grupo de estudio que eh, eh, sesiona de manera regular y que es uno de los modos, por ahí menos evidente, menos visibles, pero eh, que subterráneamente va construyendo un tejido, una trama de pensamiento colectivo y que Nelly sostiene también en reuniones periódicas y que ahora va a abrir una nueva convocatoria para los que quieran sumarse. Eh, un modo también de prolongar por otras, por otros, de otras maneras, con otros hilos, estos ejercicios de pensamiento colectivo. Y mencionar por último en que todos estos materiales van a estar disponibles en la página web del museo para todos los que quieran volver a ver y a escuchar y a compartir estas palabras. Muchísimas gracias de nuevo a todas las presentes, y particularmente a Nelly y a Judith Butler por sus maravillosos eh, ejercicios de pensamiento.